All right. Okay, so we've done this a little bit, and uh, I think it's just worth uh, emphasizing and kind of going over again how we can decide on the Millikan symmetries of molecular orbitals. Now, there's a whole section of the course on molecular orbital theory, so we don't really know where they came from yet. So we'll build molecular orbitals in the last fifth of the course. But at this point, you're just given a molecular orbital. Say you do a Gaussian calculation, and then you can go in and look at what's called the MO editor, and you can pull up every molecular orbital in the molecule. Now, the, the, the big thing, though, I want to get across is you're familiar with atomic orbitals, like the S orbitals, P orbitals, D orbitals, and F orbitals. And the molecular orbital is just the combination of those to make a single molecular orbital. So if you bring in, say, five atomic orbitals, you're going to have five molecular orbitals. Because if you think about an electron, why would it be confined to a single atom? It's now got all these positive charges, the nuclei, across the whole molecule. And so that electron is going to smear over all the other nuclei. And so you bring in five atomic orbitals, say two on this uh, atom and three on this atom, and combine them, the valence electrons, they're going to smear all over all of the nuclei and create these molecular orbitals. So that's what we're looking at. Now, I've given you this little flow chart in the notes, and it's not, not a perfect flow chart, but I was just trying to capture my thinking when I look at these. And so these are the questions I ask myself when I look at a molecular orbital and try to decide what's interesting about it and how I can assign it to a particular Cartesian axis or some combination of those um, uh, to get the Millikan symmetry, okay? And so we, we take that flow chart and we look at these different molecular orbitals. And so here's some on ammonia. We've already assigned these, but let me just go through again the, the thinking associated with these. And so I'm looking at this one here on the right and I'm looking at the Cartesian coordinate system. And so I'm looking at this x-axis, and these three lines here represent the axes, but you know how they go and they actually go through the origin. So this is a plus side of x, and over here is minus x, right? So it continues on, and there's a negative side and a plus side, just like there's a plus side for z coming out of the screen and going into the screen, there's a minus side for z. And the same for y, there's a plus going up and continuing down, there's a minus side for, for y. So that's that's how the, the symmetries of the axes are. They have a, a positive side and a negative side. And remember what's represented by this oscillating electron cloud, this molecular orbital. Let's say that, that the one color you could label positive and the other couple you, color you could label negative. But we're not really talking about charge here. It's an electron, so it's negative all around. But this side's ex say it's expanding. That's why it's a plus. And this side's contracting. So it's it's sloshing back and forth, left and right. At some time later, it'll go the other way because if it gets too far to the right, um, then uh, those nuclei are behind it, and it's going to want to go back. So it'll go back and forth in this direction. So I can look at this and I can see that the color changes. So I can stand right here at the origin of the molecule and I can look left and right in terms of the X axis and I see a positive and a negative change in that electron cloud. If I look in the Y direction, I see pretty much the same color, as I, uh, color pattern as I see if I look down. So if I look up and down, I'm looking right on a node. And so there's really no change in the Y. And then if I look up and down, like in the z-axis, towards out of the screen and then back into the screen, there's really no change in color. So I'm really looking for color changes. So if I'm standing on X, I look to the, I look uh, that direction, I see red. And I look this direction, I see green. So that's a dramatic change. I've got a change in sign. Okay. And so this is behaving like the X-axis. Now, some of you may be, may be able to look at that and say, yeah, it's sloshing back and forth and the x-axis goes in that direction. That's another way to do it. So you're just saying, where's the motion? The motion is along the x-axis. And so that's um, x-symmetry. So this one has x-symmetry.
So this is uh, the Cartesian symmetry that I've labeled here, X. And then we go find that in the, in the character table here. And then this is the Millikan notation. So that's what I'm asking for in the homeworks and stuff. I say, what's the Millikan notation for this particular vibration or for this particular molecular orbital? And you give me the from the character table what row it's on. If I ask for the Cartesian symmetry, you tell me X or Y or Z, or maybe there's a combination of X, Y and X, Z. Let's draw that, that D orbital. Um, the D, let's do the D, Y, C orbital. So I'm going to draw the X and Y axis here. So this is, um, yeah, this is X. I'm going to keep the same sort of um, coordinate system that I have for ammonia. Oh, sorry. Let me erase that. This is Y up here. And I want to do, let's, let's do the D X, Y orbital. Okay. And so Z is coming out of, out of the, out of the plane. So I'm not going to draw it because it'll just confuse the diagram. So this is the D orbital that has lobes in between the axes. So do your best to draw these little teardrop shaped lobes in between the axes. If I were to shade these, these would be the same color. And then I can come down here and I can change my pen color. Look at that. Pro, pro skills. Okay, so if I'm looking at this orbital, I'm looking in the X direction, I see a plus on top and a minus on bottom. And I look in the negative X direction, my signs have changed. Okay, so according to that flow chart, this has has uh, X symmetry, but then I look up in the Y, I see a positive on the right and a negative on the left, and I look down and they switch. So it also has Y symmetry. I look out of the plane of the board, I have that cloverleaf pattern, and I look down and into the board and it's the same, so it hasn't changed at all, so that would be like Z squared symmetry. And so, According to the flow chart, let me just go back a page. Um, let's see. So I did, is, is plus X the same as minus X? No. So I have X. Is plus Y the same as minus Y? No. So I have a Y. Is plus Z the same as minus Z? Yes. So you see my questions that I've asked about myself, about this uh, molecular orbital or this atomic orbital? And so then this first thing, is there a single X, Y, or Z symmetry? No, I have two. I have an X and a Y. So I would say no to that. So this is the important part. Is there a single X or single Y or a single Z? If so, it's just X, Y, or Z, like we had for that atomic orbital. So I say no to that. Is there a combination of X, Y, X, Z, or Y, Z? Yes, there's an X, Y. And so then I'm going to choose that X, Y row in the, in the uh, character table, okay? So this is how you would do a combination of one of those. And so I come down here and I find the X, Y row. So here's X times Y. And so this would be E. So that's, you know, that's, um, that's one of the more complicated ones. Let's do this one. So this motion here, so I look in the X direction, it looks the same in both directions. I look in the Y direction, I see a positive up here and a negative down here. And so it changes in Y. I look in the Z, it come up and go down, it looks the same up and down. And so I just have a single one along Y. And so then that's gonna be the Cartesian symmetry 
and then it's going to also be the Millikan symmetry of E. So E is a popular one today. Okay, this one here, I look in X, it's the same positive negative X, it's the same positive negative Y, and it's the same in positive negative Z because it's just the same color everywhere. So that's gonna be like X squared, Y squared, and Z squared, and I have all of those on the same row. You see X squared, Y squared, and Z squared. And so this one is gonna be A1. Let me go back to the flowchart just so you can see that. So it was the same in the X and minus X up here. It was the same in X and minus X, so it'd be something with an X squared in it. Uh, it's the same in Y and minus Y, so it'd be something with a Y squared. It's the same in positive and negative Z, so it'd be something with a Z squared. And so I would be looking at those different rows uh, for my character table. So over here, is there a single X, Y, or Z? No, there wasn't. Is there a combination of X times Y? No, I only had squareds. And so the next one, is there a combination of Z squared and X squared and Y squared? Yes. And so I'd choose the appropriate row of the character table. So that one, all three of these are on the same, um, same row. This, this, um, how to choose between these two, x plus, x squared plus y squared and x squared minus y squared. That minus means there's a color change. A color or sign. So let's look at the D X squared minus Y squared orbital. So I'm gonna draw my coordinate system X and Y. And these go right along the axis. So draw your four little teardrop or cloverleaf pattern. Let me color those in. You may want to get one of those four color pens from the bookstore. It comes in handy. I know students have had them in the past because I would hear clicks, like we change color and I hear click as they click to the next color. Okay, so let's look through the flow chart with this one. I look in the uh, positive and negative x direction and it's it's the same x squared i look in the positive and negative y direction it's the same so it's y squared and i look in the positive and negative direction in z and it's the same so it's z squared so how do i pick the appropriate row for this if you think about this this is x squared but it's a different color than the y squared and so that's why I know it's this x squared minus y squared. This is what that looks like, x squared. So think about x squared. If I'm in the negative x and I square it, I get positive values. And so the negative x direction is the same as the positive x direction because it's x squared. The same in y, but they're different color. So I have the, the x squared minus the y squared. So the y's are opposite color of the x's. And so that's what we end up with. And so this, this one right here is the d x squared minus y squared orbital. So now you know why those orbitals are the shapes that they are. These are just combinations of the different Cartesian ways of oscillating the cloud. Think about this. This is, again, it's, it's, it's expanding here. If we think the red is expanding, sometime later it'll contract. And then this side is contracting. So it's squishing in the middle squeezing out along the y axis and squishing on the x axis and then sometime later it'll squeeze out on the y x x and squish in on the y okay so here's all the molecular orbitals in water we can use these same kinds of questions here okay here's our coordinate system now x is coming out of the plane of the paper so y, uh, y and z <clears throat> are the plane of the board so hopefully you can look at this one now and you can see this is the you know 
same in X, the same in Y, the same in Z. And so that's going to be all of your squared ones. So that's going to be A1. So you could easily label this one A1. Let's, um, wish we had hand symbols, you know, in terms of picking X, Y, or Z, <laughs> but uh, I don't know sign language. So I know A, B, C, I don't know. I don't know X, Y, and Z. I know I like the first five, but anyway, can't do a poll, but let's look at this one here. Um, everybody say what you think it is in terms of X, Y, or Z on the count of three, okay? So I'll say one, two, three, and then you say it, okay? So one, two, three, go, all right, so. Oh. <laughs> yeah, very good. So yeah, Z for sure. Because again, up and down is the motion of that electron cloud and look at the Z axis, it's up and down. And so since it's, it's Z, it's also A1. Okay, uh, again, we'll say one, two, three, go on this one. So one, two, three, go. All right, good. So you see it's left and right, it's Y. Y'all are getting really good at this. So then Y, we come up here and look at it's B2. This one, I've rotated the molecule a little bit, so the coordinate system rotates too. So instead of this coordinate system, if I rotate this coordinate system 90 degrees this direction, the Y has to go into the plane of the board. And so this is how you draw it. Can you see how that's rotated? Yeah, taking that the thing and rotated it. So it was, it was like this, and now it's moved like that. Okay. And so now we look at that oscillation on, on the count of three. Go ahead and tell me what you think it is. One, two, three. Okay. Yeah, excellent. So that's B one. Okay, we've got a regular coordinate system back for this one. You've got some internal nodes here. This is uh, an anti-bonding orbital. Um, those nodes are breaking the bonds. We'll get into that with the MO theory. Um, and so on the count of three, tell me this, one, two, three. Let's see, so here's the, yeah, Y axis. It's going left and right, so that's Y. And so that's gonna be B2. And then this one is really kind of confusing. It's got some radial nodes. What I've done is I've, I've clipped off the front half of the cloud so you can see those internal nodes. Again, it's anti-bonding. It's got, anytime you have nodes that break bonds, that's anti-bonding. And so, um, you look at it, and uh, one, two, three. Yeah, so it's definitely X squared. It's the same in X, it's the same in uh, X squared up in front and back. It's the same in Y, Y squared, but definitely the top looks different than the bottom. So you've got a little bit of a red here and a green down here. And so that's Z. And so that's gonna be A1. So this just goes through all of these um, individually. But y'all are really getting good at this. So here's our answers. A1 at the bottom, A2 the next, then B2, then B1. We got that one correct. B2 and A1. Notice how you can put the P orbitals on oxygen in the same coordinate system. PZ is going to be A1. The PY is going to be B2. And the PX is going to be B1. So the atomic orbitals are also in this character table to some degree. But in terms of hydrogens over here, there's one on the right and one on the left, and that doesn't fit within the C2V character table because you have to have something rotate into something else, right? You can't just have a single hydrogen over here by itself. It's gonna interact with the other hydrogen. And so those clouds, the 1S orbitals on those hydrogens are gonna have the same frequencies. And since they have the same frequencies, they're gonna interfere with each other. It's like if you're on a radio station and you're trying to get, and there's two stations broadcasting on the same frequency, they're going to interfere with each other. And so these clouds are oscillating because they have the same chemical environment. They're the same distance from the oxygen. They're the same distance from each other. They have the same nucleus. 
uh, they're the same single electron. And so those clouds are going to either be with each other in phase or out of phase. So they're going to be the same color or opposite color. And so those two combinations have to be combined by symmetry in the character table. And so then you have to treat them together. And so if they're the same color, then we have that A1 combination. It's the X squared combination. And if they're the opposite color, it's just the single X combination. The right side is different than the left side. And so that's the B2 or X combination. And then we bring those in. So the ones that are the same symmetry, we'll cover this in detail in the MO theory, the B2 combination can only interact with the B2 orbitals. And so since there's a B2 P orbital, and that's it over here that's B2, those are the only two that this combination can interact with. So we'll find that that symmetry in the character table tells us how to build these molecular orbitals. And that's where they come from. Much more on that later. We're not testing on that today or this week, okay? Right now, we're just identifying the molecular orbitals and, and so we can do things like the selection rules. So let's see if there's, and this is kind of from your lab, let's see if there's a possibility for this electron to absorb light and go up here. And so what's the symmetry setup for that? For the N to sigma star transition. So this is a non-bonding orbital, that electron, and it's going up here to a sigma bonding, anti, sigma anti-bonding orbital. And so we would write out the upper state, B2. And then we have X, Y, or Z polarized light. And we're starting out at a B1. Okay. And so we've got to figure out, it's really three different problems because X, Y, and Z are different rows on that character table. So let's do X first. B2, X, B1. And so we go back to that character table for water and we can see that X is B1. So we put B1 in for X, and then we start doing our direct products. I need the direct product table for C2V. I'm trying to remember it. But I do know that anything times itself is A1. So B1 times B1 is A1. Okay. And in this case, anything times A1 is itself. So B, B2 times A1 is B2. So I end up with something that's not top row, so that's equal to zero. So X polarized light cannot cause this homo to lumo transition. That's another vocabulary word. This is the highest occupied molecular orbital. It's what HOMO stands for, highest occupied molecular orbital. And this is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, lumo. So X polarized light cannot cause that transition. Let's look at Y polarized light, B2, Y is B2. And then uh, HOMO is B1. Okay. B2 times B1, do you have the direct product table for me? A2. Okay, and then B2 times A2. Okay, so that integrand is not on the top row, and so that's equal to zero. So Y polarized light cannot cause this transition. Let's go over here to use Z. So Z is A1. So A1 times B1 is B1, and B1 times B2, we figured that out earlier, was A2. So the integral over all space of the interaction of Z polarized light with these two orbitals 
is equal to zero. It's not top row. It doesn't matter that it's A. It's not A1. Okay. And so this transition is just not allowed with direct for direct absorption of light. And that's totally legit. That's why water is so transparent to <laughs> visible light. I mean, if this was allowed, it would absorb. And so it would, I don't know what the difference between these two energy levels is, but it might be in the visible region. That'd be kind of a bummer that water would be opaque or at least colored, right? But it's clear because in part, because this homo to lumo transition is not allowed. And so it has to jump up to this level. You know, it's, it's a larger gap. Let's see if this one's allowed. I bet it is because we've got a B1 and then an A1 over here. And so I know that I've got to get something that's going to cancel that B1 to give me an A1. And so B1 times B1 is A1. So what is, is there any kind of light that's B1? X, polarized light. So let's look at X. So that's A1 times B1 times B1. So these guys cancel each other out and I get an A1. And then that simplifies to A1. So that's not equal to zero, which means it's allowed. So the homo to lumo plus one is allowed. And that's definitely in the UV. We know that water cuts off at, I don't know, like when, I can't remember exactly, like 150 nanometers. And so the visible region pretty well stops at 400 nanometers. So it's pretty far into the UV before we hit this transition, but that's that transition that starts to absorb light. Those electrons start to absorb light. So that makes water a great solvent for spectroscopy. So it's got a huge visible and UV window. It'll get pretty far into the UV before things will absorb. So it's not just a good solvent because it's polar and hydrogen bonds and so on. It's also a great solvent for spectroscopy because it's clear. Okay, so we can stop there and I can take questions uh, for, the, um, for the exam. I'll go ahead and let the tape run in case somebody's sick, whatever they can, they can get the Q&A session. So. Yes? Well, we didn't expect him to be able to compute an entire wave function integral like you did for that second lab. No. No, but like if you have the cosine difference or something, can you look at it and analyze whether it's a plus one or a minus one or a zero? Yeah, so that last evaluation step, I like to put one problem like that on the test where you're given the result of the integral and you have to say, is it zero or non-zero, you know, and, and why? Like that would be an explanation step. It's like, okay, this is gonna be zero because I see all of my sine terms are integer multiples of pi. And so those are zero. Because that's that's the evaluation part that 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 you have to get to. You know, once you're finished with the integrals or the derivatives and you've simplified your algebra, you're stuck with this thing that you have to analyze. You know, and that's that's where the, the heavy lifting comes. A lot of times people think the heavy lifting is the integration and everything, but it's really not. It's the mental exercise of looking at what you've got and trying to see it, see what's there. So that's what I'm interested in testing. It won't be a huge part, but it don't don't throw away points and say, oh, I'm just going to skip that question. You know, there's some practical, you know, uh, uh, attitudes that you can take, but they can hurt you in the long run to say, I'm not going to study that. So study it enough. Study those evaluation steps from that lab to see my reasoning and, you know, the reasoning of evaluating cosine integers of uh, integer multiples of pi and sine integer multiples of pi and know the difference and, and so on. Because those are, those are the skills essentially that when you get to the end, you know, even quantum number integer multiples of pi in a cosine, the even quantum numbers uh, give you plus ones and the odds, if you just draw the cosine curve, the odds are all minus ones. Yeah. So the odd multiples of pi. Those are the those are the main points on that. Next question. Okay. 
I know you have one. Go ahead. Keep going. Okay, so I will give you a good question. I'll give, I'll give you the um, flow chart. I'll give you the character tables. I'll give you the direct product tables. Everybody gets a three by five handwritten note card. So you can bring the constants. You can bring, uh, definitely, yeah, bring the constants, Planck's constant, the speed of light. Now, in terms of precision, uh, like 6.63 is good enough. And three times 10 to the eight is good enough for, for light, you know, and, and you know, 9.11 is good enough for, you know, the electron mass. So those kinds of things, all you need is really three significant figures that'll get you close enough without any rounding errors. Okay, so so you don't have to write out Planck's constant. I think it goes to eight eight digits. Because <laughs> the more things you enter in your calculator, the, the, the more mistakes you're gonna make. And, and let me show you some tricks in terms of math, right? So if we've got, um, let's say we're calculating the energy of a particular quantum state, okay? We have H squared N squared over eight M L squared. And, and so we've got Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34, okay? And let's say we're doing quantum state 5, 5 squared, okay? And we have 8 squared, thank you, thank you, squared. And then the mass, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And our, let's say we're in five angstroms, so five times 10 to the minus 10 meters squared. Okay, a lot of numbers to put in the calculators and people are always screwing up the powers of 10 and so on. You can separate out your powers of 10. Okay, so this can be written as 6.63 squared times five squared over eight, 9.11 times five squared. Now this is the, the part. So then I have times, let me, let me erase that part right there. Okay. Times 10 to the negative, and it's two times 34, so that's 68 minus 68 right and then down here this is in the denominator so that's 10 to the minus 31 but it's in the denominator so it's a plus 31 plus 31 this is 10 to the minus 20 in the denominator so it's going to be plus 20 up here have i got all the powers of 10 yeah a whole lot easier to add and subtract these so i can do 6.63 squared times 25 divided by 8 divided by 9.11 divided by 25. So the 25s even cancel. So why type them into the calculator, right? And I'm not going to screw that up, hopefully. And then it's times 10 to the, you know, minus 68 plus 31 plus 20. Go ahead and do that. And then I have my answer. Yeah, so this is a whole lot easier in terms of... Um, Oh, and the other thing, too, that I would bust you for and that you're going to screw up is I didn't use my units because I was focused on the powers of 10 meters per second squared here, kilograms, meters. And so you've got to make sure that things cancel. Okay. Let's see. Oh, squared. So then I have a joule um, times a second here. Okay. And so then my meters are squared here. It's meters squared per second. Okay. So then my meters squared cancel this meter squared. My per second here cancels this second. And so I left with joules. So you see how I look and check to make sure my units work out? Make sure you use those units because uh, almost always when people have problems uh, with the homework or whatever, it's the units that are messing them up. And so just always check your units and, and don't be lazy like I was and left one out right here.
All right, so that's just a little pro tip on doing these calculations when you have lots of powers of 10. Um, pull them out and, and practice that. Like redo some of your homework problems using that method because it's much less prone to mistakes on your calculator. Are you think we're going to give us a flowchart? It's the point group flowchart document you just showed us today. Yes, the point group flowchart. Yeah. The one I showed today was, it's really not a rigorous flowchart. It's more just, what do I think about? Left and right, front and back, top and bottom, you know, comparing that to X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So it's, it's um, you shouldn't really need that actually in a, as a piece of paper. You know, it's just the thinking. Look at the center of the molecule, go left and right. Are they the same? Do they change color or not? Or if the arrows change direction or not. Let's do one of those. So, um, hmm. Yeah, let's do this one first. So. So if I'm looking in this molecule and I, and I see, a, I look, um, I look this direction. So I look um, at this arrow and I see the arrowheads pointing at me. And then I look in this direction and I see the arrowheads pointing away from me. They've changed sign along the Y axis. And so that same flow chart could work for the, for the arrows too. I notice that look, standing on the oxygen or near the center of mass, and I look to the right and I see an arrow coming at me. I look to the left and I see our arrow going away from me. Then they've changed sign. And so I know that along the Y axis, I have a sign change. And so that looks like Y. Um, I look in the X direction, which is coming out of the plane of the board. I don't see any arrows at all, really. And I look in the Z direction, I don't really see anything going on. And so this is a Y, has Y symmetry. So you could use the same kind of thinking with the arrows. You could also use those component cancellations that I did before where, where I, I, the, the up and down parts cancel, but the left and right parts don't, and it's moving in the Y direction. Okay. Is that okay? All right. Everybody's going to buy you a Starbucks card later. They're asking all the questions. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Do we need a or no? Oh, um, you know, it does make it easier for the multiple choice part. So let's go ahead and do a, that, uh, the green one that's uh, 50 questions. Even though it won't be 50 questions, that's the, the size format that I like. Um, and so go ahead and buy a pack of those for the semester. And that way that part will be real fast to grade. And it'll help me get your grades back to you quicker. So I'll run those through, zip, zip, zip. And then I'll grade the handwritten part because I want to see you think. I want to see you use your units, okay? Um, so I can count off if you don't use them. <laughs> All right, and and so then uh, so then I'll be able to quickly grade that a, a lot faster. So great question. Yes. Um, on that. A eight eighty two E eight eighty two. That's what it is. I couldn't remember the number. So the E eight eight two. I believe that's. that's the one. Um, on if we're uh, using a scantron and just looking at the you know the homework quiz, which was an example of mm -hmm. example one. On here, number four, you've got um, six options. Yeah, I'll have to cut it back to five. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have to. Yeah, I have to be careful with that. But on the on the blackboard ones, I like to go crazy. Sometimes they have seven or eight, <laughs> and I can't really ask pick all that apply either. I, I don't know how to do that on the scantron, so it's probably going to be one answer per. Yeah. Yes. And then, um, question about what we were doing this morning, because um, I'm assuming what we did today will be on the test. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, and this is probably going to be more questions for office hours because, um, but anyway, I'm trying to understand how on the very first one, uh, when we were using a Cartesian X symmetry, I understand the color change and it's up here on the this X one axis. Yes. Okay. I get that. But what I, I'm having a hard time with is um, how you got the Y axis in there as well. Because if you're going uh, up and down, mm -hmm. right, you don't see anything. I call, I call it like just a gap, right? Yeah, it's a gap anything. right there. Yeah. And you don't see anything in the Z axis either. Yeah. 
So uh, where did the Y come from for the DXY? For the DXY. Because you have up there DXY. So oh yeah. In the yeah, for this direction. one here. Yeah. So where did that come from? Okay, so looking in the x direction, I see. Let's say I'm standing right here, and I'm standing upright. So, um, I'll draw my little person. Okay, so I'm standing there. My head is right at the at the origin, and I look this way, and I see positive above me, and I see negative below my eyes, and I turn around, and I see that those signs have switched. Now po negative's up and and positive is down, so just like like picture me standing right here with my head on the on the origin, and now I'm looking this direction. Above me is positive, below me is negative. You see that? Now I'm looking in this direction, and they've switched signs. So above me is negative and below me is positive. So from my perspective, I look this way. I see a certain pattern, charge pattern. I look here and it's swapped. So because there's a sign change left to right, that's like my x-axis. If I look at the x-axis, I see positive numbers. If I look at the negative x-axis, I see negative numbers. So that's where the x came from. Same thing for the y. If I look up, I see a particular charge pattern left and right, say positive and negative. And then I look down and they've swapped. Now this is negative and that's positive. And so since I've seen a sign change, if I look at the y-axis, I see positive numbers. I look down, I see negative numbers. There's a sign change up and down. So that's a y. So that's, that's where the y came from. So I saw x and y. I saw a sign change when I went in the x direction versus negative x direction. And then I saw a sign change when I went in the positive and negative y direction. But if I look in the z direction, it's the same up and down. There's no change in sign when I go past the z, yeah, uh, positive to negative z axis, because these are these are sort of you know round, and so the the top half looks just like the bottom half. Do you have a positive in the third quadrant there because you have a negative times a negative? Yes, and in fact, this is a mathematical thing. This is the y axis times the x axis. So all of the numbers in this plane. Uh, are going to follow that pattern. So these are the positive x numbers times the positive y numbers in this quadrant. And then this is positive y times negative x. And this is negative and negative. They cancel and I get positive numbers down here. So it has the exact same. This is the Cartesian symmetry of all of those numbers in those four quadrants. Yeah. Excellent observation. And then over here I have positive x times negative y. So that's why I have negative numbers. So this pattern you should recognize going forward because we see it quite often. We see it in the dxy orbital. We see it also in, uh, uh, let's look at cyclobutane, where I have a, a cyclobutadiene. It's got two double bonds, okay. So we've got this, this molecule here. What if I have a stretch here and a compression here and a stretch there? and a compression there. And this is the X and this is the Y. Look up here. This is this bond is increasing, so that's positive. This bond is shrinking, that's negative. This bond is increasing, that's positive. This bond is shrinking, that's negative. Plus, minus, plus, minus. That is X times Y symmetry. So that vibration is going to be XY symmetry. Yeah, so XY is fun to find. It's like you see it, you're like, I got it. Plus, minus, plus, minus as you go around. And and so that's, um, let's, this is kind of advanced, I know, but let's do that one now where, where both these hydrogens are stretching and both these hydrogens are compressing. And this will be our last one that we do. So these are stretching and these are compressing. And this is the x-axis. So my arrows. So can you see how the hydrogens are all moving towards the x direction? You know, the ones that are that are shrinking over here, you know, they're getting they're going to the right and getting closer, but the 
the closer part kind of cancels and they're moving to the right. And the ones that are getting further away are getting further apart, but they're also going in the X direction. Sometime later, they're going to switch and go the other direction. So that's X. So that vibration is just X. And of course, it doesn't apply to this character table. This is a C3V character table. So you would never use this character table to assign things. You would go find whatever character table the cyclobutadiene is in, which I think is like a D4H, if you think those bonds are all four the same. So they're not exactly the same. So, um, but anyway, let's pretend they are. And that would be a D4H. Okay. Three minutes, we have one more question. Yes. The numbering in the lectures are kind of walked off a little bit, but it's definitely like uh, they'll say L1 through L7 or 8 or 9. Yeah. Yeah. So those first ones. So you go to go to Kahoot, look for chem underscore prof um, and search 4448 and you'll get all the Kahoots for this class. And then those first, you know, eight or ten will be in this material. Yeah. Yes. So this one is just Saturday. Do you recommend we do the quiz before we take the test? Oh, I did it Thursday night. Yeah, I oh, okay. I made it Thursday night. Yeah. So and it, yeah, so you'll see. It says it's due Thursday night, which is a little fast because again, it's to prep you for the exam. All right. Cool.